So, as you know, Pastor Dermot is doing a series which is going to go for the whole year at least. It might even go for longer because he's bitten off more than he can chew. But it's called Where's God? And in the context of that series, Pastor Dermot has asked me whenever I preach at the moment is to take one of the letters, one of the epistles, I'll explain that in a moment, from the New Testament and unpack that a little bit for us and see where do we see God in that particular book of the Bible. So, this is an overview of the New Testament. Each little triangle coming in from the side represents a book. And that's very small, but names of books are listed at the point of the triangle. There's 27 books, and these are cleverly colour coded. Oh, so the top four, the red ones, the red, yep, are the Gospels tell you about the life of Jesus, four different accounts. The next one is the book of Acts. And that is the story of the formation of the church after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the first few early years of the church. Luke and Acts were written by Luke. Yes. So, Acts is a continuation, like part one and part two. So it's a great thing to read those two together and look at the similarities between those two books. So, then we have what's called the letters or the epistles. The yellow ones are... Paul's letters to churches. So we looked at a couple of these recently, um, late last year and early this year, and Paul wrote to a bunch of different churches, and they are called the epistle or the letters to the churches. Epistle just means letter. So the green ones are Paul's letters to individuals. So not only did he write to churches, but sometimes he addressed a letter to an individual. So then those ones follow in green. The blue ones are epistles or letters that weren't written by Paul. So it's a bunch of general letters from, uh, written by other people. And the last book is the book of Revelation, which is kind of like the culmination of the story of the Bible. And I should point out that some of the authorships who actually wrote some of these books are contentious, debated topics. So this is the order that we have, and this is the reason we have a particular order in the New Testament, but it's not clear-cut whether... Paul wrote all the ones there, for example, and who wrote Hebrews, for example, is a contentious issue. So there's a little bit of debate in academia about that. So today we're looking at one John. <coughs> there should be a Baptist applause at that point. Woo! One John. Woo! One John. Yeah, okay. So, John. who wrote one John? Yeah, John. John. Well, John, <laughs> presumably. So this is one of the ones that's a little bit debated. Traditionally, the disciple John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he wrote about himself in the Gospel of John. Traditionally, he wrote the Gospel of John, the letters 1, 2, and 3 John, and the book of Revelation. But he doesn't actually say in this book of 1 John, this letter of 1 John, that he, John, is writing this letter like he does in some of the other books. So there's a little bit of debate. The traditional view is that the disciple or the Apostle John is the one who wrote this. It was written late in the first century, so maybe 60, 70, 80 years or so after Jesus' death and resurrection. And it was a general letter. It didn't go to a particular person or a particular church. It was kind of like a, a letter thrown out there to the broader church at the time. And it was addressing widespread heresy and complacency. So the church had been going for a few decades, and the early on it was full of enthusiasm, and great things were happening, but over time some of the, the enthusiasm was lost, a bit of complacency crept in. Mm -hmm. There were second and third generation Christians who didn't have the eyewitness accounts anymore of the, of the early church. And things changed a little bit, and there was some heresy and some complacency. So John wrote this pretty late in his life, toward the end of the first century, to address those issues. It's a profound book. Mm. I'm not sure if you've read it all the way through or not, but it is a profound book. And it's full of some wonderful things and incredible wisdom, but there are also some tricky verses that you would read, read through and think, I have no idea what that means or how that fits in with the rest of the story. So just acknowledging that fact that it's not all clear-cut, but there are some wonderful things. 5.16, verse, chapter 5, verse 16 is mentioned up there, and that is one of the tricky ones if you'd like to have a look at that. And there are five chapters in the book. So why... Did John write 1 John? 
and starts off this, this book with a bit of a story about the word of life and Jesus and how the early disciples and the disciples actually met with him face to face and experienced incredible joy in knowing Jesus. So one reason John writes this book is that he wants to bring back people to the fullness of the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. So that experienced it in a special way, face to face, when Jesus was walking on the planet as a man. But he was bringing back, or attempting to bring back, the fullness of joy. Mm. And the verse where he says that in the book is this. We write this so that you or our joy might be complete. The you or our, some early manuscripts say our, some manuscripts say your, that's debatable. The we, if you want some homework, why it says we and not I, you can go ahead and do your homework. Mm -hmm. 1 John 1 4, 4. We write this so that your joy might be complete. The next one. The reason you write is so that you won't sin. So that you live a victor victorious, not a defeated life. Yeah. And the verse for this one is 1 John 2 1. I'm writing this to you, my children, so you do not sin. There are lots of contrasts in this book of 1 John light and darkness, <coughs> truth and lies. Righteousness and unrighteousness, old commandments and new commandments, love and hate, life and death. And some of these contrasts are in the, con in the context of sin and righteousness. Thirdly, he wrote so that you are aware, or his readers were aware, of false teachers, enabling them to discern between Truth and lie. Yeah. Mm. He talks a bit about antichrists, little antichrists, as opposed to the antichrist. And he talks a bit about how you can discern falsehood from truth. And this is what he says: I write this to you about those who are trying to deceive you. One John two twenty six. And the last reason that he states in his letter as to why he wrote it was to give you assurance of eternal life. Mm -hmm. It was to make sure that his readers and us today know what we have. Mm -hmm. Assurance of eternal life. And the verse for that one is in chapter 5. It says, I am writing this to you so that you may know you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And that's a great thing. Isn't it? Mm. That we're not floundering, floundering around in the dark, wondering what we have, <coughs> or what we believe, or what our eternal destiny is. Mm -hmm. But we know, we have assurance that we have eternal life. Amen. And for me, that's the crux of this book. That's the take-home message for me. And I'll come back to that one in a moment. So the major themes are life, Fellowship and the concept of abide is tied in with the concept of fellowship in the book and also knowing. Now, I'm going to enable you to read the entire book. Ooh. There it is. <laughs> Can you zoom so, in? Can I zoom in? Right. <laughs> the oh, so, the reason I've done this is that if you look closely, there's some um, words highlighted in yellow. Now, a little bit hard to see, <laughs> but if you just scan through all that, all those verses and all those words from one of them. You see them, Pam? Yeah. Are your eyes? Yeah. Same age as me out here, so your eyes are not as good as they used to be. <laughs> are we the same age? You're a bit older. I think you're a bit older. No. <laughs> so I can actually read it. I don't know who else can read it, but I can read it. I may be close to that, but I can read it. So, yeah, okay. the yellow dots, if you like, can you see the yellow dots? Yeah. If not, this is just not going to work. They <laughs> <laughs> use, use different backgrounds around the outside to try and make the yellow bits stick out more. Uh, nothing worked. So, the yellow bits, words, are the word life. Yes. So, I'm telling you that life is a theme of this book. Yes. It crops up a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. There's a lot to say, how many times? 16. 16 times. Ah. So here are the key verses about life in the book of 1 John. 
The one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. You realise that there's a sermon in each one of these verses. <laughs> so we could, I'm not going to go too fast because I want you to drink this in this morning. So I've quite a few scriptures to read. But the one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And in this fellowship we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. Chapter 2, verse 25. In this fellowship, I'll get back to fellowship in a moment because that's the second theme. We enjoy the eternal life. We enjoy it now. Mm. The eternal life. We enjoy it. We've got it. We enjoy it. Mm. The third one. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. I'm not going to look at anyone. <laughs> Do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in it. We know what real love is. Remember, no is one of the things we're going to get to. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Chapter 3, verse 16. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. That's pretty black and white, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What a great scripture. Mm. Moving on. So that's the first theme, life. The second theme is fellowship. And you can see it pops up a few times. You see the other dots again. You see oh, the yeah. word fellowship. Yeah. How many times? Eleven. 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 And I'm tying this one in today with the concept of abide. Now, abide, how many of those are there? Oh, there are a lot. But in this case, abide is used in a number of different contexts. So that's why I probably included in, in brackets. But if you're doing four things, then maybe the fourth thing would be abide. And here are some key verses about fellowship and abide. We proclaim to you that we ourselves have actually seen, this was right at the start of the book, okay, when he's talking about the fact that there's eyewitness accounts of Jesus, that we lived with him, we saw him. We proclaim to you what we, or what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised to us. So just as He, the Holy Spirit, has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. That's a good one to take away from this morning. Yeah. Remain in fellowship with Christ. Mm -hmm. And by this we know that He abides in us, by the Spirit whom He has given us. And by this we know that He abides in us in us, by the Spirit whom He has given us. Mm. We know. We know that God abides in us. We abide in Him, He abides in us, we know because of the Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit teach us? Remain in fellowship with Jesus. And the last one there, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in in him. The third theme is know or knowing. Quite a few of those. What's the number? 41, I think. 41 times. That's why I said earlier on that for me, this knowing idea, this wow. knowledge of our salvation and our relationship with Jesus is the key theme of this book of 1 John. These are some of the key verses. We'll take a while to do all 41. <laughs> I've just got fried for you. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. I want to make the point that the knowing and the abiding 
comes before the obeying of the commandments. It's not like we think, oh, I've got to be good so that I can know God, therefore I, I obey the commandments and that's how I demonstrate that I know God. Mm. It's the other way around. We know God, right. yeah. God abides in us, we abide in Him, and therefore a natural outworking of that fellowship yeah. is that we abide, obey His commandments. We don't have to think about it. Yeah. He dwells yeah. within. Yeah. We just live our life as Christians mm. and we end up obeying His commandments. Yeah. The second one. For the Spirit teaches everything you need to know. There's that knowing. And we know He lives in us because the Spirit He gave us lives in us. We know that God abides in us because of the Spirit. You might have noticed that some of these verses are in two or three different things. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up His life for us. And we know that the Son of God has come and He has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. Yeah. He's given us understanding. <clears throat> now, there may be only one person in the room who recognises that power from God. But this is an album, and this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about progressive rock, or prog rock. And if you can read it there, prog rock is a subgenre of rock music. Are you wondering why I'm talking about this, by the way? Gotcha. All good. That emphasizes ambitious compositions, classical influences, experimentation, concept driven lyrics musical virtuosity, and lengthy compositions. So prog rock started in the 1960s and grew in the 1970s. Some of the early prog rock bands are King Crimson, Yes, Genesis, ELP, Jethro Tull, Camel, and then in the 1980s, a band called Dream Theater came along, 1985 I think, and they are a massive prog rock band these days. And then in the last few years, there's some, there's some other ones Pop up, my favourite of which is the Pattern Seeking Animals. <laughs> if you had a band and wanted a name, would you call it, would you call it Pattern Seeking Animals? And what I love about the Pattern Seeking Animals is that they actually have a hyphen between pattern and seeking, which is required, and it makes me feel good on the inside. My grandmother yeah. is satisfied by the Pattern Seeking Animals, and I like their music. Ah. So, these guys, these are expert musicians. They are just incredible musicians who play prog rock music. And a few years ago, maybe in the early 2000s, someone decided to get some of these guys together and produce a new band. And this included serious players like Mike Portnoy from the Dream Theatre, he's a drummer of the Dream Theatre. And they're their ambition or their mission was to combine sophisticated music, that is complex composition and virtuoso performances, with accessible mainstream songwriting. And that band is called, or is called, Flying Colors. Mm -hmm. And that's a picture of their album. Mm -hmm. yeah, from Pilot, I think the first one. So, it was, it's complex music, it's many of those band names I've thrown out there, many of you wouldn't have heard of before. It's not mainstream. It's um, not, it, it's good music to listen to, but it's not, you're not going to hear it on the radio. It's not a three minute jingle kind of song. It's serious music with classical kind of um, overtones and influences. So, what these guys wanted to do was to make it accessible. So, they searched the world, they got these serious musicians together, they searched the world for someone who could be the best songwriter to take what they can do as musicians and make it accessible, and make it accessible, make it mainstream. Mm -hmm. And have a listen to this later if you'd like to. But this was the result. Something that was or is complex and difficult and not everyone's cup of tea. The point of this band is to make it accessible, to give access to people to this type of music. Mm -hmm. And they do a brilliant job. So, when it comes to our relationship with God, 
How's this going to tie in? <laughs> so I want to take a notice in case I forget a word or two. So over here I have some books. And these books, some of these are in the go to the op shop pile. <laughs> easy fish cookbook. <laughs> Quick and easy seafood. With the names are wrong. <laughs> so, these books today are going to, despite their title and their contents, are going to represent theological books about Christianity. Mm -hmm. So, ignore what it actually says and just pretend. Can you pretend? Yeah. yeah. Pretend this is a book on personal eschatology. Wow. And there's going to be a few theological ideas I'm going to throw out now, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, but each one of these has bucket loads of books written about it, and debates, and academia, and papers in peer-reviewed journals, and lots of things going on. So they are serious topics of study, and a lot has been written about them. So personal eschatology, this little flimsy little seafood guy, doesn't really measure up to the amount of research that's going into the subject of personal eschatology. But that's one. Another one might be propitiation. Ooh. Lots of research on that. Oh, wow. There might be one on the ordinances of the church. Oh, yes. Volumes and volumes and tome after tome has been written on the ordinances of the church. Yeah. That's that one. Supra lapsarianism. Oh, is this one. Whoa. Another great topic to get your head around. Yeah. The impassibility of God. Ooh. And that's another wonderful theological idea. <laughs> no. It's a pastor book, that one. <laughs> and evangelism. Massive topic. <laughs> All sorts of ideas written over the years about evangelism. So, do you understand what I'm doing? Yep. Despite yep. what they really look like, these books represent those topics. Okay? Sure. And the last one, who likes the far side comics? Gary Larson. <laughs> this is the complete. Volume or two volumes is massively heavy. Wow. So, this one today <laughs> represents everything else. <laughs> so, all the theological ideas that you could possibly come up with, and all the books, all the sermons, all the lectures, all the peer reviewed journal articles, everything about all the theological ideas about God and Christianity. This one represents that. So, I put them all on the ground, not because they're not important, not because they're not useful, but because for you to connect with God, they are unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah. So what is complex just thinking back to flying colours, what is complex and difficult, not everyone's cup of tea, becomes accessible. And God's truth is that Jesus is accessible. You don't need to know lots of other stuff. It's great if you want to, and if there's, and there are some theologians, theologians who work on this kind of material and make it simple for us, Simpler for to understand, that's wonderful. Mm. But Jesus is accessible. Yeah. You don't need a PhD. Yeah. You don't need to go to Bible college. You don't need a certain IQ. Jesus is accessible to everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And knowing Jesus brings eternal life. <laughs> So, the key point today is to know God. Yeah. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's all you need. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. He's accessible. He wants to have fellowship with you a lot more than you want to have fellowship with him. He's mm. desperate to have you in close fellowship with him. 
We abide in him, he abides in us. He is the way, the truth, and the life. <coughs> That's from the Gospel of John. It's possibly the same author who wrote 1 John that we are looking at today. In John chapter 15, the Gospel of John chapter 15, it says, I am the vine, this is the words of Jesus, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's all about Jesus. Apart from him, you can do nothing. He is the vine, we are the branches. And it's all about the spirit within us. God's spirit within us. He teaches us everything that we know, need to know, and he abides within us. And because he abides within us, we have eternal life. Mm. We have the joy of eternal life. Mm.